privilege of swimming with him will speak um, of Otto's graceful stroke. The writer Daryl Bristow Bovey in his book once wrote when uh, after viewing Otto in the water at Sea Point Pavilion, each individual movement is so slow but has an overall effect of such speed you think it must be some subtle illusion using mirrors. He doesn't make ripples but a lo low glossy bow wave and behind him the water seems calmer for his passing. So to speak to us about graceful strokes and a number of other interesting topics, I'd like to introduce and hand over to Dr. Otto Tanning. Hi, Otto, how are you? Doing very well, thank you very much, Tom. And thanks for the introdu introduction. Over to you then. Great, well, I've been asked to talk on cold water capers and um, any form of swimming, in my opinion, requires uh, an exceptional team. And I've been very fortunate to have a number of people who've helped me. This is Roger Finch. And these are some of the others, Lewis, Martin, Tracy, and they've been a fantastic support to me and it's been a privilege to swim with them. So thank you very much to all of you. Um, in discussing this, um, I want you to make, us, make it as simple as possible, and I've divided it into four compartments. The first being mindset, the second being uh, issues relating to stroke, and then cold uh, adaptation. The last one is actually a massive um, amount of information, and it's really not something I want to touch on uh, to this evening. Um, it'll be a great talk um, at a later stage. So we won't, other than mention the importance of it, uh, but we won't go into detail. So one of the most important factors in any challenge is the mindset. It doesn't come down to who has the most talent or intelligence. It comes down to who's willing to make the choices that others are not willing to make. In other words, at five o'clock in the morning, whilst others are asleep under their duvets, you're out there training. I'm losing my slides, it doesn't work. Okay, so the role of the mind, as far as I'm concerned, is that it needs an attitude of intent as to how the challenge will be confronted. It demands finding out everything about the challenge. It requires a dedication of purpose and effort, and it mandates a belief in yourself and in your team. The challenge starts with the first stroke, and when one, what, that one has been made, there's one stroke less to go. Lewis has got this. He's got the mind that when he sets himself to do something, nothing gets him away from it. It's a sort of a dedicated arrow that goes to the heart. And this is a picture of him having swum in a river um, in uh, the Antarctic. And obviously you can see the effect that it has. And this is something that I think is important. Um, it's not uh, an issue on how one accommodates to swimming in normal water. What Lewis is showing is a mindset that he can tolerate it and he can go on and do the, within the limits of um, uh, the temperature that his body goes to. So let's look at stroke. Stroke is, is being comfortable in a steady stroke. It's not a race. It needs a sustained and high energy output and requires as perfect a technique as possible. It needs a te technique that is efficient. Karina's got this. She's got a magnificent stroke. She's got all the attributes. And the one thing that puzzled me at no end about watching her swim is that she never seems to breathe. And when she does, it seems to be very easy. And that became very e easy for me to understand later when I found out that she's a professional flautist. But if you have the privilege of watching her, she has the attributes of the things that I'm going to discuss. So the breakdown is that you look at the body segments, the head, the position, a breathing and balance. 
The arms I've put in green because it's the main generator of thrust and they do need recovery. And I'll talk about that just now. The trunk basically coordinates balance and co connects the legs to the thrust generators, which are the arms. And the legs give you minimal thrust in open water and long distance swimming, but is crucial for body balance. And I divide the stroke into four quadrants. The first quadrant is the first one at the front, this one, in other words, from horizontal in front, all the way down to vertical below the head of the swimmer. That's the first quadrant. And the second quadrant is the one before, before after that. And what is relevant is I need to demonstrate this. In other words, the first quadrant is this movement. And the second quadrant is the follow through. We'll talk about three and four just now. The important thing is that what is important uh, that what is happening is it's below it's below the surface and if you don't concentrate on that you're going to miss out on some of the things that you see down there like this young lady swimming without a top you have to concentrate under uh, on, on the underwater side the most significant joints in swimming are the shoulders they take the most stress and generate the main propulsion the shoulder joint has the biggest range of movement but they need to be very flexible, and that's very important. And it's very important to look as to what I mean by be, being flexible. I don't know if you can still see me. Obviously, the range is tremendous all the way up and down and the side. But what is really important is this is rotation of the shoulder. In other words, the shoulder joint is doing the rotation. The arm's just waving because of it. And that's something that's very important to understand what the range of movement is about. So the shoulder joint has the biggest range of movement, but they need to be very flexible. And there's an example. This is um, Michael Phelps, and he's just about to swim in the Olympics, and this is what he can do. Just look how close his fingers are on his back. And that flexibility is in his shoulders. Now, the big thing about water is it's impossible to grab it. You've got to hold a volume of water by capturing it. That means you have to encompass it and exert pressure on it. This creates a pocket of pressure, which you can then use to put your le leverage on, and this thus move yourself onwards over it. It's completely different from exerting a force on a weight on land, because on land you can grab it with your hand. You can't do that with water. This is an example of creating pressure cells in water. These guys are sculling. There are four of them on either side. And if you look behind, if you look behind, these are pressure cells that they've generated. And what's generated them is this, the actual ore. And the ore is a magnificent piece of um, aerodynamics. And we don't have them. We've got an entire arm that we have to control. So on land, I mentioned that you can grab things. And this is a um, exercise um, a sister, and he is holding on to um, a weight. And when he pulls that, he's going to pull it because he's grabbed it with his hands at the top. And that's what it looks like when he pulls. Notice where his shoulder and where his elbow is. His hands are getting very close to his face. And if you translate this into a lateral supine situation, he's dropped his elbow and his hand is ready to push downwards towards the floor. And what that's going to cause is to lift his head, but it's going to cause absolutely nothing to give him forward direction. So you look again at the four quadrants. Number one is probably the most important to give you forward motion. And number two is probably not as important. One gives you about 60% of the entire uh, thrust forwards and the second um, quadrant gives you about 40%. And that's what I've just said. 60% of forward thrust can then be lost in that quadrant one 
if you don't create a pressure cell. And the pressure cell you've seen with the scullers. What is being generated if you drop your elbow and you don't use quadrant one properly is that you generate thrust downwards and this will lift your head. If you lift your head, your hip, hips will sink and this creates resistance. And this is exactly what you don't want to do. Number one, lose 60% of your thrust. And secondly, have your hips go low. And the solution of this is this concept of an early vertical forearm with a bit of body rotation. And here's an example of what I mean by an early vertical forearm. This is the shoulder, here's the elbow, and this forearm, remember that this is the arm and that's the forearm. This forearm is nearly vertical. And that's the first thing that's happened in the first quarter. There's another example. It's a high elbow. It happens to be a, a young lady who wants to swim butterflies, so both her arms are being used. But look where her elbows are pointing. The elbows are pointing upwards. Here's another example. And this almost looks as if she's got a dislocation somewhere. But what she's got is fantastic purchase which started when the wall, when her hand was fully out in front of her and is now nearly vertical. And this is early uh, vertical forearm and this is Ian Thorpe. And this arm, the left arm, first of all, the elbow is slightly outwards. It would have been pointing almost directly upwards in the first quarter and it's about to go into the second quarter. And I believe that he's got the very best technique in this whole challenge. And this is what you see if you look at him swim above the water and you see nothing of the work. You're only seeing a recovery stroke and I'll talk about the recovery stroke just now. But there is one thing about him and that is he's got a fantastic bow wave. I don't know if you can see my arrow, but at the front of his head, he's got a superb bow, bow wave. And what it means, the water level, more or less at his mouth, dips below what you see. There's his mouth. It's actually out in the open. So this is part of his success of not having to roll his whole body too far. This is another guy. That's about 100 years ago. That's me. It's the same problem. And the only comment I would make on that, because it's probably oh, too old, is that my hand should have got my fingers painting, point, pointing downwards. It's a little bit too stiff. And if you look very carefully, there's one joke here. There's a little water level in this eyeglass. And somebody said, how do you become optimistic with a misty optic? And I didn't have an answer for that. There is a bow wave. And again, my mouth, although you can't see it, is fully in air. And that's because of the bow wave. It's gone down at the point where my mouth is. So that was segments one and two, which is propulsion, the forward force. Segments three and four are recovery. In other words, we're talking about this aspect and coming through from here all the way to the front. And the recovery issue has got two aspects to it. Number one, it's to allow the muscle to get perfusion and oxygenation. And number two, to get your arm, from, obviously, from the back to the front. In other words, we're talking now about three and four. Now, this is the only one uh, slide of, should we say, a bit of physiology. It's a graph. The red line is the pressure in the arterial system at the beginning of ventricular ejection. At the beginning of ventricular ejection which is at this point. In other words, the pressure goes up all the way through as the ventricle is contracting, then it stops contracting, and then it slowly goes down. Don't worry about the kink, there's a reason for it. It goes down to the next ventricular uh, contraction, which then goes up. So along the y-axis, we've got pressure. Notice that the pressure never really goes below 80. The average pressure, which is this one, is sitting around about 90. 
The systolic pressure is 120. And these are the two numbers, that one and that one, that they measure when they put a cuff on your arm and will find out about your blood pressure. But this pressure, the average pressure during this entire heartbeat is what perfuses muscles. And this is actually very important. This guy is an athlete, but as far as his ability to do athletic exercise, he's very limited. What his aim is, is to create muscles that look like this. And it is, to some people, it is amazingly good. In terms of swimming, it's amazingly bad. And the reason for that is the pressure in those muscles to get to that level as he's standing, posing, is higher than the mean pressure in the arterial system. Now, what that means is that those muscles in the chest of this man are losing their perfusion and these, those muscles are becoming ischemic. In other words, lacking oxygen. And what is important about that is it causes dilatation within that muscle. And that's one of the reasons why it gets so big. It certainly isn't a reason as to why he's able to do things more with those muscles than anybody who doesn't do this. So the aim is always to keep the wrist lower than the elbow. And here's a beautiful example. The wrist is lower than the elbow. This is a mirror image of that. And I thought it was a great picture because this is a Robin Island swim. There's Table Mountain, and there are two other people swimming. And the big objective is that in this position, that's in the segments three and four, the hand and that arm must be relaxed. So you should be able to wave the fingers in that arm completely loosely like that. They should not be rigid and they shouldn't be contracted, the muscles shouldn't be contracted because it is very important in the segments three and four to have relax relaxation in order to get perfusion to the muscles of propulsion. The second big thing about the stroke is efficiency. And it's measured as the lowest cadence to achieve the best forward speed. It's the lowest number of strokes per length. The effort has to be on catching the most amount of water. And the key is efficiency underwater. A simple way to, attend, to assess the pro your progress in trying to achieve it is to count the strokes per length. You use that as a measure of improvement. And the objective is the lower the number, the better the efficiency. And then, of course, many, many hours, gently in cold water, as often as possible. And this is an interesting one, because this, in the background, is actually a reflection of Cape Point. The water was almost like glass. But obviously, we were moving through it, and we're getting a bit of ripples in it. But it's a great photo, because it shows a good stroke, in a good environment, the arm that's up, as you can see, which is segment three and four, should possibly in this particular case be a little bit, uh, a little bit softer, a little bit more flappier. So that was stroke. The next is called adaptation. And that's important because before you do it, you've got to know what the temperature of the water is. So you've got to feel it. And if you don't do it right, you're going to end up and look like this guy and go home with that appellation. The answer is to just get in and push. And this is a picture of me getting into the Dover water. And you know it's cold because look at the fingers. You can't see that it's me, but look at the fingers. That poor guy is saying, Jesus, this is cold. It's a different challenge to train your phys physiology to do this. I consider this one of those remarkable uh, abilities that Lewis has got. He's jumping off a part of a ice flow into water where the temperature is zero. This is in the Southern Hemisphere. This is obviously the Antarctic. And can anybody tell me why I say that? And before you all shout, it's because this is land and there's no land in the North Hemisphere. Cold adaptation, the issue is that it's possible to train the ability to swim for long periods in cold water, not in that type of water that we've just seen that Lewis can jump in. It's not 
about training to be cold. It's about training to avoid becoming cold. And that's very fundamental. It's going to feel cold if you get into cold water. But the training is to avoid your core temperature from dropping. In other words, you shouldn't become cold. Now, there are a number of crazy things that some people do. This is a Russian lady. They cut a hole in the ice in some Siberian lake or sea, and she's stark naked, and she swims with beluga whales. And she does it in this way. I had to go very carefully through the slides that I was going to select to get one that I could present without being too, shall we say, below the belt. She gets fed air by two people who've got one centimeter thick wetsuits, and they hand her a chance to breathe a little bit, but this is what she does for quite a while. But she, like anybody, like Lewis as well, has a limit how long she can be exposed to this water temperature. And the limit for this is usually around about 22, 23 minutes, but the recovery is many, many hours. So these amazing people who can do this will tell you about how long they swam in this cold water, but they don't tell you how long it took for them to recover or what some of the Sequili were. And to mention something that Lewis had after one of his swims, no feeling in his fingers for quite some time. And that, in my opinion, is dangerous. This is another crazy concept. This is a frozen lake. The guy is skating, and there's a guy underwater, and he's swimming below the ice, under the ice. How long he can do that, I don't know. It depends how quickly he can get uh, air. But I mean, it's a amazing picture and a fantastic concept. Now, the whole point about um, warm-blooded uh, um, mammalians, the core temperatures differ in various species. Whales are about 36, man is about 37, cats and dogs are a bit higher, up to 39, goats 39 and a half, and there are birds that are as high as 40. And why is there a need to regulate temperature? And the answer is that it confers a huge advantage in refining metabolic functions and thus development. All our enzymes function optimally at 37 degrees. It's the basis for the evolutionary dominance of mammals over reptiles, and it's the basis for the massive complex neurological development of Homo sapiens. But it comes with a very high cost and that's high energy need. I don't know whether you have uh, ever watched some of the YouTube presentations of what happens in the wild, where you've got a badger fighting with a snake or a python. The snake is a, is a reptile and the badger is a mammal. Guess who usually wins? It's the ma mammal because they have the ability to be quick, which the reptiles don't because of the temperature of their core. So in the human uh, 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 environment, our heat loss and heat lane are, rele uh, are relevant. In water, heat loss is by mainly conduction. And of relevance is the fact that water conducts heat 20 times more than air does. There's a certain amount of heat loss by evaporation and radiation and convection. There's also something called, uh, called insensitive loss which is heat loss from your breath. But your heat gain is mainly by metabolism. There's very little by radiation. So it's a balance. You've got heat loss on the one side, where it's mainly through conduction, and you've got heat on the gain on the other side, which is mainly at, uh, on metabolism. And you are aiming to try and maintain a core temperature of 37. The regulation of the core temperature, and remember, the core temperature we're talking about is not the core that you have in an apple, which is C-O-R-E. This is core, which is the heart. And if you want to know what your heart temperature is, the best way of doing that is to pass a rectal probe fairly deeply. And not many people like doing that, and that's why we don't have a lot of studies on it. But uh, it's, it's important. The regulation of the core temp is through the autonomic nervous system. And it's an automatic process which is governed by this governor in the brain, in the hypothalamus. So what's the secret to cold water acclimatization? It is intense training of the autonomic nervous system. 
It has to be on a regular basis. It has to be with increasing time of cold exposure and decreasing degree of cold to a level that is appropriate. By that I mean not to the level where water starts to do funny things between five and zero. The objective is to train the autonomic nervous system to reduce heat loss early, and that's very important. The other objective is to train the autonomic nervous system to increase metabolic heat production early. Both of these things will happen once the core temperature starts to fall, but that usually is after about half an hour to an hour. And the objective of the training is to, for it to happen as early as possible, in other words, at the time of immersion. So in other words, the real objective is to get the reactions by the heat conservation mechanisms to kick in as quickly and as flexibly as possible. And there's a concept that this is a reactivity of the autonomic nervous system, which is characteristic of youth. So what we're trying to do is to train to regain the reactivity of the autonomic nervous sense, uh, um, system of youth. So therefore, this is a very good thing to do because it's a cruel anti-aging tool. Hang on, sorry. So the effect of the autonomic nervous training is early shutdown of peripheral superficial circulation. In other words, that's where you are losing heat and that shuts down. So your skin and your subcutaneous tissues become quite cold. The blood is diverted away from there and the core temperature loss is then less. We can increase our metabolic rate and we can do that very quickly if we have to, and especially if we train. And then there's a selective diversion of blood to the rele relevant musculature. And all this can occur before the core temperature starts to fall significantly. And the, this proof is and has been labeled anticipatory thermogenesis. <clears throat> and it was this, this demonstrated in the study of Lewis Pugh by Tim Noakes. And this is the one other physiological uh, graph, which I think is worthwhile looking. Here's our normal temperature. The y-axis and the x-axis uh, is time. Everybody starts off at 37 and they stay at 37. If you then tell anybody, not Lewis, but anybody, the red people, that you're going to get cold in 20 minutes, they even start getting cold already, and then their temperature drops very rapidly once they are in the cold water at this point. And they go down fairly rapidly and they reach, after about 30 minutes, a level that is significantly dangerous and they must be taken out. But if you deal with somebody who's truly cold adapted, and this is the experience with Lewis Pugh, you tell him he's going to get cold in 20 minutes at this point. 20 minutes later, his core temperature is 38.5, one and a half degrees above what we call normal. And it stays like that while he's immersed in the light gray area for at least 15 or 10 minutes. And then it slowly starts to drop to a level where at half an hour, he's still very close to normal. He's still very close to 36. And this will go on longer than most people. And it's only at this point where he needs to be taken out because anything below this is exceptionally dangerous and is severely hyper, hypothermic. So how do we train to do this? In Cape Town, we train in the cold Atlantic, and that changes all the time and poses lots of challenges. But we're also fortunate to have the Sea Point Pool, the pavilion. There it is, well known to all of us. But what isn't well known and the relevance of it is that it's a 50 meter length pool and it's salty water. Right now it's around about 21, 22 degrees. That's a little bit higher uh, in January. It, fall, it falls very slowly to about 12 degrees by June. And that gradual drop is the very best way to cold adapt 
as long as your exposure is regular. And that's one of the reasons why that pool is so popular with the swimmers. By July, you've been adapting your entire autonomic nervous system very well, and you're ready to tackle any cold swim or the channel. And the other, of course, answer is that the Northern Hemisphere, this is reversed. And that's one of the reasons why South Africans have been very more successful in terms of the English Channel uh, statistics than any other nation, if you look at the numbers. First of all, we've got to get there, and secondly, we've got to train for it, but we've got the advantage of what I've just mentioned. So the method of training is repeated uh, exposure to cold water, increasing time spent swimming, slowly decreasing the water temperature and exposure, and slowly increasing the time of exposure. The objective is active conditioning of the autonomic nervous system. And remember, it's not about training to become cold, it's about training to conserve core temperature. That's the end of cold ad adaptation. Nutrition is not something we're going to tackle tonight. And therefore, I say thank you very much for listening. Thank, thanks, Otto. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very, very insightful. We've got a couple of questions, if you don't mind, staying on for a little bit longer. No problem. Um, so uh, the, the first question was, do you have any tips for recovery when you're training for a big marathon swim? Recovery of, of cold or recovery in between swims? Well, um, the, Recovery, I think, from from the cold as well as uh, you know muscular recovery as well. My opinion is that it is important to train to be to to get into cold water, and as I said, the training should be progressive in terms of dropping temperature slowly and time spent in the cold water. And if you overdo it, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt your muscles. You're going to feel as if you've done something you shouldn't have done. And I don't think it's good to train in circumstances after that. And you've got to wait until that discomfort goes. I was actually just speaking to Martin earlier. He went and hit a uh, golf ball and he felt absolutely that he'd done something that he'd never done before. He was very unfit and very, um, say, muscle sore. But as a swimmer, He's one of the most people I know, and he gives hell in, in the water to me. And uh, I think the answer is don't train when you are sore and give yourself a chance uh, to, uh, to, to um, recover. And the other one is during that time, it will be a very beneficial thing, and that is to stretch. To stretch. Okay. All right. Um, and then just a, a sort, of, sort of observation when we were going through the, the, your, your stats is that you, you got your first Robben Island crossing was done, um, I think, in your 40s in, in, in 1990. Um, how, were you always a cold water swimmer or was this something that came to you later in life? And how did you get to do your first Robben Island? Yeah, um, it's a little bit long. I'll make it as short as possible. I actually qualified in my surgical training in Johannesburg. And I only arrived down in Cape Town around about 1974. And found to my horror, because I loved swimming and I had a competitive background, that I couldn't swim in the cold water. I could get into Clifton as far as halfway up my calf, and then I had to get out. And I found that that was really terrible. And I persisted and ended up by speaking to Kevin uh, Fialkov, who uh, I had known very well through his water polo days, and asked him whether he wouldn't mind taking me on board and teach me how to swim in the cold because I can't do it. Mm -hmm. And the uh, condition he laid was, you can certainly do that, but don't ask, uh, so don't question me. You can ask questions, but don't question me. And <laughs> if you accept that, we go three times a week, and it will take you three months. So the first Monday, it was Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I was on the uh, beach at, at Clifton Fall, waiting to swim with him. He was also dressed, I had costume and cap and goggles, and we walked into the water. We got halfway up the thigh, up, up the leg, up to the knee. He said, you're gonna stop and talk to me for 10 minutes. We stopped and talked for 10 minutes. 
And then he said, goodbye, I'll see you on Wednesday. And the same thing happened Wednesday, same thing happened Friday. And I was starting to wonder what I should ask him. The next week, started on a Monday, and we got up to the groin. The third week, got up to the nipple level. And the fourth week, up to the neck level. And by that stage, I thought I was bad, but I had given him my honest uh, promise never to question him. And we then, only after the fifth, sixth week, were able to swim head up. And then we increased the time from 15 minutes to about 25 minutes. And then we had the next great week where I could swim head down. And then he said to me, at this stage is around about 10, 11 weeks. This is quite a, 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 a challenge from my side because I had to keep my mouth shut and be polite. He said, we're going to go from, um, from um, uh, Granger Bay and we'll take a boat and we go out and swim a little bit in, 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 in the bay. Mm -hmm. So I said, great. And he said, but don't change. Get your togs and get on the boat and off we went. And that we did. And after an hour, I said to him, this is rather funny. He's going a hell of a long way. And then I saw, God, the island's getting very close. And we got to the island. So I said, what are we going to do here? And his answer was, I want you to swim through the kelp. You've got to learn to swim through kelp. So we're going onto the island. I'm going to swim with you. So we get onto, onto that rock after the kelp. He says, now you follow me. We go to the boat. And then we'll swim around the boat which we did, and the boat started to go towards the sea. And after a while, I said, he's not going to stop for us. I said, Kevin, what is he doing? We can't get to him. And he said, Otto, swim. An hour later, he said, now you can stop. And I looked, Laubert was a hell of a way in front. The island was a hell of a way behind. And then the penny dropped. He was bloody well taking me to, to Laubert. And we, we completed and I can tell everybody that for me, that swim was like winning a gold medal at the Olympics. It was just amazing. Mm -hmm. That's how it started. But the bottom line was, had he said to me the night before, listen, we're going to swim Robin Island tomorrow, I would have had a very good excuse. I wouldn't have done it. So that's how it started. Oh, wonderful. And uh, yeah, for those who don't know, Kevin, of course, is Warren Fialkoff's father. Um, yeah, no, one wonderful story that. Uh, yeah, some other questions that have come up um people saying somebody saying that they're quite new to cold water swimming is there any rules of thumb around if you're getting into 12 degree water that you shouldn't stay longer than a certain amount of time or is it is it very individual do do, do does one take the uh getting exposure in cold water as a very individual exercise or, or are there rules of thumb i think it's very individual i don't think you should start in 12 um, I think my, my concept of starting in warm water and going all the way down, like from January through until July, in the sea point pool is probably the ideal. Mm -hmm. Do you know, the, the sea water temperature, uh, the other day it was 18 of Clifton. And yeah. four days later, it was 10. So to get into that, if you jump into 10 degrees and you are susceptible and not cold adapted, you're going to get frightened and you're going to get pain and you're going to find a hundred reasons why this is not for you. Mm. So in my opinion, if you want to start this, you start slowly and you start it with reasonable temperatures, like mm. now in the uh, pavilion, and you accept it's going to take months for it to drop down. And if you persist by the time it's down, um, you are cold adapted. And what mm. the cold adaption is about is the ability to retain core heat. And there's nothing, in my opinion, worse as an experience for somebody to be, become really cold. It's a frightful feeling. You have no control. You lose your mind and you lose your muscle ability. And it is frightening. Mm. And those people will say, this is not for me. It can't be done. So my advice is start light with somebody, a group of people that swim regularly. And the most ideal is obviously the pavilion. Uh, or find a situation where you don't go into really cold water immediately. I have great admiration for people who can, and Ryan, I can see you uh, looking on or a uh, picture of you. Uh, how you do it is amazing, just so that you know all of you. At the moment, I have a personal limit. I do not get into the water if it's under 14. Okay. And all right. Middle, so I'm looking straight at Tracy, and she's sort of smiling. Because she swims regularly, she swims regularly under five. And I 
it's it frightens me. I think it's amazing. Well done. Right, so I think we've run out of time. Thanks for everybody for joining us. Thank you so much for your insights, your wisdom, and your uh, your passion and your motivation to all of us. Uh, yeah, I think you the the number of people that you've touched over the years, I think, is uh, is countless. But thank you very much, Otto, for uh, for putting this together and spending your time this evening sharing uh, all this insight with us. Thanks everybody else for joining us. Uh, we hope to do this every few weeks. Um, we will give you an uh, in invitation quite soon to the next event. Um, we hope to do a combination of presentations as well as uh, interviews as well uh, with some well, very interesting swimmers. And we'd hope, to, uh, hope that you'll join us then and tell your friends. So until next time, it's goodbye from us. Thanks very much. May I just have a word just to say thank you to everybody who watched, but especially those who are not members of the CLDSA. It's a great organization. Please join it. Thank you, Otto. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Bye.